At Balchem Animal Nutrition and Health, we strive every day to deliver results you can see in your animal's productivity and your bottom line. From a smooth transition into the milking string for your fresh cows, to a happy welcome home from your furry friend. From a strong start in your poultry flock, to consistent weight gains for your finishing hogs. We expect to earn your business and your trust with our people, our products, and our science. Our people have an intense passion for your animals and your success. You can count on us for honest, candid advice and practical solutions for your toughest challenges. As the global leader in choline production, chelation, and encapsulation technology, we take our obligation to you and to the environment seriously. Our products are backed by the most extensive and thorough research portfolio, while our business is committed to advancing environmental sustainability and animal welfare. In the end, it all comes down to results. Balchem delivers real results you can count on, results that exceed your expectations, and results that bring true value to your bottom line. Leading the charge to meet the nutritional needs of ruminants, monogastrics, and companion animals, Balchem offers a growing portfolio of nutritional products and a dedication to innovation and industry sustainability. Balchem is here to solve today and shape tomorrow. Every expectant mother knows that what she eats impacts her baby. And now research shows that is also true for our cows. Maternal consumption of Reassure during late gestation had a positive effect on the in utero calf, setting her up for better health and potentially even higher milk production once she joins the milking string. Learn more at balchemanh.com slash launch and launch your herd for life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. I would now like to introduce Dr. Mark Hannigan. Dr. Hannigan began his career as a dairy farmer in Western Iowa, followed by a BS in dairy science from Iowa State University, an MS in animal science, and a PhD in nutrition from UC Davis. He also completed his postdoctoral work in biochemistry and biophysics at UC Davis. Mark joined the dairy research group at Purina Mills in 1993, and moved to the Department of Dairy Science at Virginia Tech in 2005. He works in the area of nutrition uh, and nutrient metabolism using experimental and mathematical modeling approaches focusing on protein and energy metabolism. The long-term objective of his work is to improve animal efficiency and to reduce the impact of animal-based production systems on our environment while maintaining a viable industry. He is an author or co-author of more than 130 peer-reviewed uh, research publications. Dr. Hannigan, take it away. All righty. I need to share my screen. So I just want to, today I want to talk to you about the actual program that we've used. You've had us, uh, been able to watch lectures from a variety of different authors from the group on the development of the model and, and the sort of workings of the model. And so today we'll just focus on using the actual software. And I, I you know, I need to credit uh, all the members of the committee that uh, contributed to the development of the of the overall system. And in particular, uh, Abbas Ahmadi um, is on the in the back row next to uh, between Dr. Ferkins and Dr. Vanderhaar. He's a programmer that uh, worked for his career at University of California Davis and. Egg extension uh, group. And so he uh, developed this software for us. And without his efforts and, and time spent on this, uh, it, it wouldn't have come out nearly as easily as it did. And I won't say that it was easy, but it was certainly easier because of his knowledge and background. If you want to download the software, it is freely available from the National Academy uh, of National Academy Press website, which I have bookmarked at the bottom here. and and my slides have been shared from the teacher today. I'm actually not going to be using my slides today. I just wanted to make sure and acknowledge my 
committee co-members and also to point out that website link. And so you can go to that website and download and install the software. Um, and if you've used the old uh, 2001 program, what Abbas did was he rewrote the old software and, and updated it. It was written in Visual Basic, you know, 20 plus years ago. Uh, we were able to get that source code. And so he actually rewrote the code in C Sharp. And so it, it has it has the same look and feel. I mean, it looks very similar to the old one. So if you're used to using the old software, then you should have shouldn't have any trouble using the new software. But of course, it <clears throat> it has a, a whole new model behind it. And the reports have been updated and we have some enhanced functionality in the software, but the general layout is the same. So if we switch to that <clears throat> software now, and I've already started it here, it has uh, along the upper uh, top left, the same tabs that we had before. So we have an inputs screen, a feeds screen, a ration screen, the ability to select reports. And there is a help section, and this is going to bring up another website. And so it's web-based uh, help, right? And so uh, if you ch choose that, then you can look up information about the program and, and uh, also help on the program. But it's not intrinsic to the software like it was before. So if we go back, and, and of course, we have the standard uh, file menu. So if we load a simulation, so as before, you can save simulations. It comes with examples for lactating cows, dry cows, uh, transition cows, and replacement heifers and calves. I have more than that in here because we, of course, were testing things as we went. But I'm going to just start with actually one of the standard examples, which is, and we'll start with the young calf. And so any, any work that you do on a particular program, you can save uh, and it will be available to recall later. So if we, we go back to the input screen, after having loaded that calf model, you'll see in the upper bar above that it is in brackets, example young calf, that was the name of the file that I opened. As before, you can choose to work in metric units or in our quaint little uh, British leftover units. You can work in dry matter on a dry matter basis or an as-fed basis. Uh, I prefer metric and I prefer dry matter. You can uh, sort of clean up some of the directories with some of these buttons over here. So there are some output files that are generated uh, when we run the program, particularly when we're doing reports and, and uh, couple of other functions. And so you can clean those up with these other buttons. And in the right hand side of this panel, then we have a list of, I think it's 10, 1, 2, 3, 14 different uh, lines that can show on the sidebar when we're working on the ration. And so in the old program, those also showed and you had a fairly limited list. But now if we unclick the use default uh, set of, of sidebar items, we have a drop down list that has a more expansive list of nutrients that we had before. Okay, And so they're alphabetically organized. And so you can choose whatever nutrients you would like to appear. And so for example, if, um, if I, you know, want to look at maybe instead of dietary group protein, if I want to look at RDP, this won't be a very good uh, reason, thing to look at for a calf because we don't really have an RDP uh, model for the calf. But at any rate, if I choose that, then you'll see that that will show up in the sidebar when we go to the diet. The next subsection for the uh, inputs screen is the animal description and management. And so we've chosen a calf. Uh, there's still a couple uh, glitches in the software that we're working on. Of course, we hoped it was all done and clean after several months worth of work, but I noticed yesterday that uh, even though when we hover over most of these fields, it will give us a tip. And in this particular case, it tells us that we're going to enter age in weeks for calves and in months for other animals, but the label is not changing. 
Okay, and so we did pick a calf. <clears throat> we are entering four. That means four weeks. And so I sent that off to a boss yesterday to get that fixed so that when we choose a calf, that label changes to weeks. And I noticed a couple other minor things like that. We uh, entered, because we chose metric, we will enter the calf body weight in kilograms. So we've got a four-week-old calf weighing 60 kilograms, attempting to reach a 700-kilogram mature weight. That is the breed average for Holsteins, or it has it is for the last 10 to 15 years. If you would like to, you know, if, you're, if your Holsteins are bigger, which certainly our Holsteins are on our, our farm, then perhaps you would want to have a target of 750. It's not a big deal <clears throat> for calves, but of course for heifers, that target weight will help set the growth curve. We have some items in the middle on production that are not pertinent to calves. So we aren't interested in the pen of cows in, in terms of how, what proportion is multi-parous. We aren't uh, interested in days in milk or age at first calving or days pregnant, but we do have a, a temperature activity for calves. And so it basically has some effects on calves and some minor effects on cows as well. And so we have a thermoneutral temperature chosen here. Uh, the calves, uh, we don't have any grazing options for calves really. And so that is disabled. And so there's nothing there to enter for calves. And same way with the condition score, we're not using condition score for calves. On the production tab, we can enter the growth rate. So we've entered uh, 0.6 kilograms per day. And uh, in the case of, of calves, that's the only really entry we have for production. Um, in the, if this was cows, then we would have possible growth rate for, for particularly for primiparous animals and body reserves uh, replenishment rate. But that's not pertinent for calves. Milk production times milk, milk composition, et cetera, is all not pertinent for calves. So those are the extent of the settings for a calf program. If we then move to the feeds section, we have, uh, in this case, because I pulled up an existing one, if I started with a new program, this would be empty. There'd be no feeds entered in here, but we have an existing diet here as an example. And so uh, we have calcium carbonate and corn, dry ground corn, uh, magnesium oxide, milk replacer, that's 20% group protein, 20% fat, some molasses, oat grain, soybean meal, and some sodium chloride. I, I like my, uh, my nutrients or my ingredients, I mean, to be ordered. I don't like my, I don't want it alphabetically. I want my minerals and vitamins at the bottom. And so I typically will first reorder things if it's uh, something that's pulled up from somewhere else and put them in order at the bottom. And uh, I tend to like my grains and forages first and then my protein supplements second. So in this case, I may put the milk replacer first. So you can reorder these in terms of the order that they appear. And that will also change the order that they appear on the ration screen. If I wanna add a new feed to this uh, diet, then I click on the add feeds button. So again, all of this, if you've used the old software, should look very familiar, okay? It's, it's really the same general approach. We have multiple, uh, the, the, we can look at all the ingredients at once. And so you can scroll through, I think there's about 200 ingredients that we have pre-entered. You can add more ingredients. If you want to find a particular ingredient, ingredient so maybe in this case, I wanna add a, a liquid feed. We have some predefined liquid feeds or liquid feed ingredients here. They are defined on a, typically on a dry matter so if I chose, for example, maybe I want a higher crude protein milk replacer, whatever I choose will show up below. And so, for example, if I also maybe am going to feed some waste milk, perhaps I want to also add some waste milk. So each time I click on one of these, it will add another entry to this matrix below. And so if we scroll across, you can see that the dry matter is low. In other words, they are liquid feeds. They're not dry concentrate feeds. And so the entries, you know, are on a dry matter basis. 
but they reflect that liquid feed. And we, we need this category to be separate because we use the difference between dry and liquid feeds to help us predict calf, a portion of calf intake. So after having selected those feeds, and if I want to select other feeds from other categories, then I just need to switch to that um, and, and select a feed there. Okay. Um, so maybe we're going to let them chew on a little bit of hay. And so we're going to put some mixed hay in. And so once I'm, I'm done with these, then I can add selected ingredients to the diet. And if we want to remove, uh, let's see. I'm for, I forgot how we actually remove it. So if you don't want to add one, let's say, oh, you press the, press the delete key. Okay. And so you select the ingredient and then you press your delete key and it will be removed from that list of ingredients. So I'm going to just add these two ingredients to this diet. They will show up at the bottom. You know, I want to put the milk replacer up with the other milk replacer that I already have there because I might be switching from one to the other in the same way with the whole milk. And so I can add those and put them in the order I want. And if there's any of these in particular, for, for example, let's say that um, we have a, you know, a custom milk replacer. So maybe this is not a, a standard milk replacer that meets exactly these criteria. It's some milk replacer that we're, we bought from a company and it has slightly different nutrient components. So if we select that ingredient and click on the edit feed components and nutrients tab, uh, button, it will open up the nutrient entry screen. And you can see what the nutrient composition is that's been entered for that particular ingredient. And you can change these. And so you can see some of these fields are empty, like the A, B, and C fraction and the rate of degradability and digestibility of, of RUP because these are not pertinent for our calf feed. Okay, we don't have a, an RUP, RDP model for calves. We simply work off of uh, a crude protein to metabolize what protein basis, recognizing that they're, they're basically minimally functioning ruminants. But for example, if I, you know, if this was really a 20% fat uh, milk replacer, I could change that value here. And if I wanted to do that and I wanted to, to make sure and save that so that I could use that modified milk replacer. So if we change this to 20 and I want to change that uh, and use it again for other calf programs. I can change the name up here. You know, perhaps uh, mill XYZ to, to make me remember where we're getting it from. And I can save that. And that will be saved in this uh, diet only. So it's only in this simulation file at this point. And you can see that it's added an asterisk to the front of it to denote that this is a user modified ingredient. It's not a standard ingredient from the library like these other uh, values in here. Okay? So if I want to use that in another calf model, for example, I can add that feed, save it to the feed library. Okay? And so if I, if I click on it and then click save to feed library, it will prompt me to add ask if I really want to do this. And if I say yes, it will add it to the feed library. And so now if I go back to add feeds to the ration and I look under milk replace, well, you can see right away, it's already at the top of my, of my feed list. And because I left the diet or the uh, category alone, it's also shows up when I drill down to the calf liquid feed. And so now I can use this in any other uh, simulation file that so let's cancel out of there, and we will uh, simply remove that feed from the feed library by selecting it. And so now it takes it back out of the feed library, and now it's just a local. Okay. So I can edit and make and, and add and subtract as I want. There's a couple switches down here to for young calves, you know, before they start ruminating to discount the ME from solid feeds for recognizing the fact that there's an undeveloped ruin there. And so we 
discount things a little bit for that. There's also a uh, choice that you can use for what one might characterize perhaps as, as slightly cheaper or, or perhaps not quite as available milk replacers that contain plant protein sources. I don't want to suggest that all of those are bad, but certainly, uh, you know, some soybean isolates are very good and feed just as well as, as milk replacer. But if there's plant protein sources in there, then you can choose that. And so the calf model will then reflect some of those choices. Okay. So if we go next to the ration page, we are, uh, can see the ration as listed. I've added these two ingredients. They're uh, both in, uh, with zero entry. So for perhaps I want to feed 0.65 of this modified milk replacer rather than my standard milk replacer. And perhaps I know I'm putting in, you know, 2% of the diet as, or maybe 5% of the diet as whole milk. I can enter in either column, okay? I can either enter kilograms per day or I can enter as a percent of the diet, dry matter. So you can see now that I've now got a diet that represents more than 100% of, of total, okay, which is not what we want. We have a total intake right now of 1.388. Based on what we've entered for this liquid feed, the estimated non-liquid feed is 0.41 kilograms, basically. So if I use that estimate, it will transfer that to the non-liquid feed and remove that amount from the total intake. And so it basically, within you know the third decimal point, sort of equilibrates these to 100%. So I can now refresh this sidebar over here and note that I have my diet RDP added in here, which is like to say not a particularly useful thing to look at for a calf, but just to demonstrate that what we chose on that input screen shows up in this sidebar. And so I can look at these different nutrients that are generated as a result of that diet. So as I manipulate the diet, you know, perhaps I take out the whole milk again. So we go back to zero on that. Re rework our diet to reflect the new choice for the amount of liquid feed that's being fed and then use the refresh sidebar, it will change these nutrients. So you can quickly look at the key nutrients that you need to be paying attention to and derive a ration that looks or a diet that meets those main requirements. And then when you're happy with it, we can switch to the reports screen and we can choose subcategories of reports if we wanna look at. So for example, for a calf, um, you know, our, there's some of these uh, areas that maybe are not that important to look at, but let's go ahead and just look at all of those quickly. And so it generates ex uh, a selected reports and the, the report viewer that I'm going to use is Word. There's also a uh, open source copy of a Word type um, file or program that will be loaded on your computer that can be used, or you can transfer some of the report information, particularly the diet ingredient list and the proportions directly to Excel for doing other things with it. So when I generate this report, it's going to pull up a copy of Word and transfer the reports to that copy of Word. And so they're organized into the report sections that we listed in the checkbox list. We have sort of the animal inputs that you selected okay, as a user just to replay to you, okay, this is what you selected. You know, does that, is that really what you wanted? And also as a record of what this predicted performance and this predicted diet outcome pertains to from an animal standpoint. We've got the dry matter intake that was uh, derived basically and selected. We've got our entries for frame gain, for body reserves gain, uh, which is in zero for this particular case because we don't have that considered for calves. A total body gain, which is equal to the frame gain. So frame gain is lean growth gain, okay? And body reserves is really for more mature animals just changing in fat reserves. And our MP allowable growth based on the model is 0.51 and our M energy allowable, I'm sorry, yeah, MP allowable is 0.51 and energy allowable is 0.51. So 
just by happenstance, I you know, happen to choose one that's fairly well synced up. These are sort of the classical definitions of those two. Um, so those are providing an idea of the, the rate of growth that would be supported by that diet that was chose. We have a, a nutrient summary on a dry matter basis for the overall diet. In the next section, we have in, in the second section of the, of the re report section two, we have the listing of ingredients, the amount as fed, percent as fed, amount dry matter, percent dry matter, all now with enough decimal points that you can take it to a feed mill and actually get a uh, diet formulated and, and produced without having to hand enter all the values from the screen, which was the case before. In section three, we have macronutrient contributions from individual ingredients where they can be calculated. If I had entered cost, the cost would show up here along with the total. The uh, percent of the, of, of the dry matter is shown in the next column. And then a base DE calculation, okay? Crude protein, NDF, starch, and then total fatty acids. So we can get an idea of the contribution of those major nutrients from each of the feed ingredients that are included. And then an energy summary, which is expanded and I think more useful than in the past. So we have GE, gross energy, digestible energy, metabolizable energy for calves. And so we have uh, the contribute or the amount of each of those. And so you can see as you walk down through what proportion is digestible and actually we calculate that for you. Uh, it's 89% of the GE is digestible energy and 80. 5% roughly of GE is metabolizable energy. We have then below that the requirements for maintenance for thermal stress, which we had none, for frame gain. And those are summed then for a total requirement, and then a balance is calculated. Okay? And so based on our inputs, the uh, uh, amount that was provided by this diet is just slightly less than what was required. Um, less probably pertinent for cows but possibly in the in the future uh, more of an of a concern for cows would be the fatty acid supply so we have not only total fatty acids that are you know calculated for the model but we now have a feed library that contains the composition of those fatty acids with respect to c12 through c18 3. and so you can see what the intake is per day and the concentration as a percent of dry matter for each of those fatty acids and then some protein and amino acid uh, supply and requirement information, uh, fairly limited for calves, but uh, still what's pertinent. So we got a supply of 200 grams a day. Uh, just a small little dribble of that might be coming from some microbial protein. Most of it is, is coming from uh, uh, RUP or, or we're not calculating an RUP really, but uh, there's still some work to, I think, to be done on this because some of these things, probably the MP from microbial and from RUP probably should not be showing in this table. And then net protein and metabolizable protein. And so we sort of partition out the requirements and give you a balance and an efficiency calculation and ratio that to ME. And so it's just some more, a lot more information than perhaps you got in, in the last version of the model, in the software. And then vitamin and mineral supply and requirements. And in some cases, these are based on absorbed. In other cases, they're based on diet concentrations, which is denoted in the footnote. And uh, then a breakout in the end of the ingredient or mineral contributions. So if we close out of this and go back to the software and then briefly come back to a reload a simulation from a lactating cow. And I'll choose the, the standard lactating cow for 100 days of milk, which comes with the software. And so you can see that it's loaded that example from the top. We'll leave the inputs the same. We'll go to the animal description just to review. It's 100 days of milk. Uh, age at first calving is 24 months, uh, 40 days pregnant, at thermoneutral temperature, 54 months of age. 700 kilogram of body weight, 3.0 condition score, mature weight is 700. So it's not growing, it's a mature animal. Not grazing. If it were grazing, I could enter topography, distance between pasture 
and the milking barn and the number of times per day that the animal has to walk him back and forth from the pasture to the milking barn. Given those values, it will calculate an activity uh, add-on for the maintenance requirements. Feeds we've already been through, so it's the same basic idea, right? Uh, nothing is different other than we're presented with a couple of additional or different questions below, so we can use uh, 48 hour NDF digestibility values as received from a lab in vitro values. They're used to calculate then a estimated true digestibility of the forages, or you can actually apply it to all ingredients in the diet. There are standard values for essentially all the ingredients in the diet. You do need to review those uh, to make sure you're not missing anything, particularly if you've added some ingredients or we can choose to not use those and then the standard flat ones will be used and so we're not reflecting any differences that might be apparent based on the in vitro analysis if we're feeding monensin we can choose yes uh, of course we should add probably a monensin to the to the ingredient list I, I don't have we don't have one in a library actually so i don't have that there and essentially that switch is a fairly simple one it simply increases the DE to ME conversion by, I think it's 4.6%, and it reduces the methane production uh, by that relative amount as well to essentially transfer energy that would be lost as methane into ME. Okay? And so that will then improve the efficiency uh, of production of that animal. Okay, so I might reorder these ingredients, but I don't want to take the time. So if we go to the ration page, just as before, we've got the list of ingredients. We can modify the ingredient inclusions based on kilograms per day or on percents. We now have a couple of different predictions here for intake. So we can either enter an intake that we want. So for example, instead of 28.49, maybe, maybe my pen of animals is only making 26. And so if I enter 26 and set to 100, it basically will sink all those down or, or scale all those ingredients down proportional and use 26. There is an intake equation just based on animal size, days in milk and milk production. So I could use that estimate and that will transfer that to my total intake and also re, uh, redo all of the inclusion rates again and, and set it back to 100%. There's another intake equation that uses those animal factors, but also uses the amount of forage and starch in the diet. Okay, so an ADF, or sorry, NDF and starch are used, and that will then reflect intake depressions that might occur from overfeeding starch or intake stimulation from feeding low amounts of fiber. And so that, that estimate might be used for this. And so it works the same way. If I choose to use that one, it will load that in and, and recalibrate all the ingredients. So when I'm done with my diet, again, I can show my ingredients over here. Now the choice of having diet RDP here is maybe useful. I see I've got a fairly high RDP diet. Um, I, you know, unfortunately, I replaced the crude protein, so I'd have to add the two together. So it looks like it's maybe a 17.5% 17, 17, protein diet. So I could probably, you know, if it would make economic sense, or if I wanted to be concerned about environmental impact, I could reduce the RDP in the diet. And so if I change and, per, for example, take out some soybean meal and uh, maybe add in, so maybe I, I, I just uh, take that to zero and put in three kilograms, replace it with, with uh, protected soybean meal, refresh my sidebar. Well, now my RDP is dropped by about a percentage unit. You know, I've added to the RUP content of that diet. So it's a very quick way to be able to rapidly derive what you want to, to use for a diet. It does not have an optimizer built into this. That, that would be beyond the scope of what an NRC or an ASM committee is, is tasked with doing. This software is really more for demonstration and for you know, occasional use to cross-check things. There are commercial companies that make professional software that include optimizers. And so that would be, you know, something that one could use with this model to derive, you know, 
uh, hit different targets. If we go to the reports then, and we stay with select at all and generate them again, I wanna focus mostly on the energy and protein report. And so if we skip down through here, you can see that we have some more items that show up here. So in terms of our entered and predicted production, we have more items than we did for the calf. And so the top part reflects what was entered. The bottom part then provides an any allowable milk, which is 57, an MP allowable milk, which is 54. Those are calculated the same way as in the past. So those are historical um, values. I will tell you, and, and you, if you check in chapter 20 of the publication, those were biased in the past and they're still biased, okay? They overpredict production. So I would encourage you to perhaps use those as a little bit of a crutch and a, and a reference point, but these nutrient predicted values are the new sort of approach that we've come up with, and they should be better reflections of what that diet is really able to produce. And I would say that the, you know, the NE and MP allowable, they tend to be uh, more accurate in the middle of the data. Okay? In other words, there's a slope bias to them. And so if you're around 80 pounds of milk in the middle of our database, they're actually fairly close to being correct. As you go up to these higher levels of milk, they overpredict, And as you go to lower levels of milk below 80, they underpredict. So they're not a, they're not a very uh, good tool to use. I just want to make sure everyone's aware of that. The nutrient predicted ones are the ones that we focused on. For example, in, in the uh, milk protein one, it was what was focused on and derived as a final uh, suggestion for the uh, milk protein output and the milk protein input requirements. Okay. And uh, diet summary is the same, uh, you know, maybe a few extra nutrients there. Diet ingredients are here. So again, you can take it to a mill, get it formulated or get a, get a mix formulated. Macronutrient contributions are the same basic list, okay? Um, energy supply, you can see we have a, a little bit, a few more rows, okay? Because we're, do, we're doing a little bit more work with uh, cows in terms of calculating things. So we got a urinary and a gaseous energy loss. So you can see how those contribute to the uh, deduct from DE to ME. And, and you can look at what those proportional losses are. And on the requirement side, you know, we've got a milk production of pregnancy. So if you, you have, we entered a pregnancy, uh, unlike the old model where pregnancy uh, requirements didn't start till I think it was 130 uh, days of gestation or 170. They start from day one here. They're very small. Okay. So you can see that the contribution or the requirement for, uh, for ME required and NE required for pregnancy at such an early stage is very minimal. Had we put in grazing and added some walking activity, it would have shown up here. Uh, we have a frame gain uh, that's showing up and we have no reserves gain because we didn't enter in reserves gain. But if had we entered a reserves gain, either positive or negative, it would show up in this table. So our total requirement uh, at target for ME is 78 megacals per day and for NE is 51.6. And we're slightly positive and balanced relative to those target values. But again, as I pointed out, they, they tend to be slightly biased okay, in terms of what that allowable milk production is. And it then breaks it down to what the contribution is to DE. We have our fatty acid supply. Now this might be more important, particularly looking at the mono and polyunsaturated fatty acid load relative to potential milk fat depression. And on the protein supply and, and amino acid requirements, we'll spend just a couple minutes on that. I'm short on time here, but uh, we'll make it. The, uh, that milk protein equation is driven from a combination of the digestible energy supply from non-protein ingredients and amino acids, and then some adjustments for rumen digestible carbohydrate. And our microbial equation is driven from a combination of RDP, rumen digested starch, and rumen digested MDL. So if you're looking to manipulate the MP supply, of course you can do that by manipulating RUP, 
and or you can manipulate microbial protein. If you want to increase your microbial protein, it, it basically is running off of RDP, ruminant digested fiber, and ruminant digested NTF, and they all three act independently and somewhat additively, not completely, but somewhat additively. It's actually a saturation kinetics curve. So if you want to get more microbial protein flowing to the small intestine to add to your MP supply, you can add rumen digested starch, rumen digested NDF, or RDP, or all three, or any combination of those to achieve that. And so our, our, once we generate that rumen microbial protein, and then we discount it for digestibility, and also for nucleic acid load, we end up with an MP in this particular diet for microbial protein of 1.1400 uh, 1, grams and MP from RUP of 1500 grams. And we have just a very minor uh, supply from body reserves, okay, given our entries. So now that's our supply. Uh, so our, our overall supply was. 2.95 kilograms or 2,950 grams. And so now where's it going? Well, we got on an NP basis or an MP basis in the right-hand column, we've got 13 grams of MP going to scurf loss, hair and skin. We've got 232 grams going to endogenous urinary losses. 484 are going back into the gut and lost as metabolic fecal. So gut lubrication, enzymes, things like that, that are slough cells that are lost into the gut and not reabsorbed. We've got just a little bit for frame growth, nothing for reserves uh, change, uh, very minor MPUs for pregnancy at such an early stage. And 2,232 grams go to lactation. So you can see it's our major use of, of, uh, of MP at our desired level of production, our target level. But based on what we've given the animal in terms of, of essential amino acids and energy supply, the nutrient allowable prediction is about 100 or, well, about 40 or 50 grams short of our target. So not too bad, but just a little bit short. So our total uh, required nutrient allowable is 2,905 grams. Our total um, Required from a, a, a target standpoint is 2976. Our dietary supply is 2947. So it's it's really close to being in balance from a total MP standpoint. Our efficiency of MP to sort of export protein, which is scurf and maintenance losses in milk, is 69%. Our uh, efficiency at the target would be 70 if we actually made that target level. And our nutrient allowable, so our, I'm sorry, our first one is what we're targeting is 69. If we actually made the target input, it would be 70, which is slightly more than our, our expected maximum. And at our nutrient allowable efficiency is 55. Okay. So a couple of ratios there. So now let's, let's dissect that protein issue. We're a little bit short of what our target is, what's going on. And so table 6.3 is, is uh, directed towards that. The things that contribute to producing milk protein output are in the right-hand column. We've got an intercept that's negative, which reflects maintenance cost, okay? Or, or really it reflects, we've, I've wrapped up not only maintenance, but also the, the stimulatory or the, the effects of fiber in, in the ration in this column, just to make it simple, okay? 760 grams of our partial contribution to milk protein comes from that non-protein digestible energy supply. Nothing is coming as far as we could de determine from the data from arginine, 119 grams from histidine, 147 from lysoleucine, 122 from leucine, 241 from lysine, 111 from methionine, uh, a minus 210 for the quadratic term for the squared of the of the essential amino acids uh, a 202 for the all the other amino acids so these are these are the ones that we consider directly in that equation and then the rest are aggregated together and they sort of offset that negative effect of the quadratic and so when you sum those up from the top to the bottom we end up with a sum of 
nutrient allowable production of 1368. And we have a predicted MP to 305 day maximum MP. So I, I skipped over that in the entry, but that is one of the entries is what is the 305 day rolling herd average for milk protein production in kilograms per 305 days. And we use that to scale our, our quadratic equation so that we can go from the more moderate production levels that are observed historically over the last 20 or 30 years in experimental settings to farm settings where these animals might be making you know 130 pounds per day or even 140 pounds per day of milk in a group and so this this ratio here needs to remain below about 0.85 or 0.8 okay so you need to monitor that when you're down in the 0.6 range that's fine okay but if you enter that 305 day uh, production uh, on the input side it should allow this to remain in the proper range okay so if you want to know what is deficient and what you might be able to do then as we as we're quickly running out of time here if we look at our predicted supply uh, and we look at our, our efficiencies we can actually look at it even easier in the next table where we partition things out to see it in the last two columns we have the efficiencies of use of each of the essential amino acids and the target export efficiencies that we think you should be trying to achieve some of these we don't have values for like arginine because we don't know what the target is for that but we think the target for that you should be able to achieve maybe as a maximum for histidine is 75 percent and you can see we're at 74 for this diet the target for isoleucine i'm sorry for histidine i'm sorry i'm on the wrong line isoleucine is 71 we're at 62 so we're, we have enough arginine or isoleucine we don't really probably need to add more of that we're okay on leucine we're closer on lysine okay we're short on on his methionine that's not to say that methionine isn't is the sole limiting nutrient okay that concept is gone it's simply saying that probably the best thing to add would you know given limited resources and space would be a little bit of methionine to this because we're, we're really pushing the animal on methionine we're over the target in terms of efficiency in term, and so we could add a little bit of that that won't necessarily give us a better uh, outcome than adding some histidine. Both of those have about the same response, but certainly methionine is one that we should be worried about given that we're below, or sorry, above the target. All right, and so that's how these values are used to help you guide. So you can go back to your diet, maybe, and add a little methionine to that diet in terms of uh, either switching ingredients or looking at some you know, metabolizable protein, uh, I'm sorry, RP available methionine so vitamins minerals are as before there is an environmental report here which summarizes water volatile solids and methane outputs both on a gross basis per day and also as a function of milk so these can be used to help you know demonstrate i guess from a more of a public perception standpoint of how we're doing with our diets and how the farm is doing overall all right so with that i want to close with one last comment uh, so when i from the software if i choose to save a uh, diet okay and when i choose save this was not going to allow me to save because this is a standard diet okay but if i choose to save it under a new name it writes that file out and it will save it and if you're doing research okay this is a research tool we have code in the scripts directory of that NASM folder that will allow you to load that saved diet. So it knows what that name is. It will go through this code and, and load that XML file, and it will run the model. The model is also provided in the scripts directory. So if you want to know any of the equations in that model, you, you, know, you can look at the 3,600 lines of code that are there, and you can source out actually how things are calculated from that okay so that's available for research use so with that i will uh, conclude my my session and i'll stop sharing briefly here and turn it back to scott all right thank you mark before we get started answering questions we'd like to share a brief video
five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab on the top of your screen. Dr. Hannigan, the first question is, um, is there a method to report and or get assistance with any errors that may occur when using the NASM software? Yes, there is. Um, we, uh, Dr. Ahmadi will provide support as you know, from the program side, and I'm, you know, I'll continue to support as well other committee members from the model side. And um, I think there's uh, instructions in the help files on how to submit a, you know, for example, if you find a bug in the software uh, or find something that's wrong in the model, I think there's a uh, link in the um, help file that, that indicates where you need to, to provide that feedback to. And so we will monitor that and hopefully respond to it in time. Right, very well. Um, Cled would like to know, what is the main purpose of adding magnesium oxide to calf starters? <laughs> you know, I'm not a calf expert, okay? I, yeah, I, even when I stay at a, at a Holiday Inn Express, I'm still not a calf expert. <laughs> so, so I, I don't, you know, I, I think there, there's certainly some, I think my understanding is there's some evidence that uh, a little bit of buffering in calves in the hindgut is, is useful, but, you know, that's a question that you need to put to Jim all right, very well. Um, Colette again is asking, uh, when is pregnancy requirements considered in calculations? We uh, we rewrote the, the code as, and if you look at the beef NRC, they did the same thing. There, were, there was actually a very nice um, model developed out of UC Davis uh, 30 years ago. And uh, they, they chose to use that. It was interesting that the two, and again, I have to point out that when you do something with 12 other people, 12 other scientists, there's never usually universal agreement on anything, okay? There, there's always, uh, you know, some, some uh, uh, spirited discussions at times, okay? And so you end up at a consensus that uh, most people can live with. <clears throat> so the 2001 committee, I'm sure, had those discussions as well. I found it interesting as a, as a scientist and as a modeling person that they chose to use that Davis model for all of the or all the mineral uh, equations that were in the, the reproduction model. But then they used a linear equation to do the energy and the protein calculations starting at, a, I think it's 170 days of gestation and then just cutting it off at 232, 262 or whatever it was. And, and instead of using that nice smooth function that was an exponential growth with the decay at the end, to you know, properly represent the the growth curve of the fetal tissues and the fetus itself. So all we did is we we adopted that, and the beef group had done the same thing, and then we re refit it to the old uh, Allen Bell data that was used before, and, and really is the only data that I'm aware of. And so the requirements start at day one. Okay, they are minimal until you know 100 days in mil 100 days in gestation or so, but they start at day one. All right. Next question. Do you know if this NASM model is being incorporated into any other commercial software? Uh, I, you know, I've heard, uh, you know, various people talking about it. I, I, I assume that it will be, but I don't, uh, I don't have an update from anybody in particular. And I suspect they may not want to tell me because, the, you know, they're, they're competing companies. And so, you know, what they're doing is, is their business, I guess. And so they'll launch it, I presume, when they, when they get ready to. All right, thank you. Michael would like to know, does the fatty acids uh, include EPA and DHA? Oh, uh, we got, I'm very poor with the names of those, okay? I, I'm much better with the numbers. So we, we have C18O, C18-1, C18-2, C18-3. The C18-1 is trans and cis. Uh, I think we have C16-1 as well. Um, so those are, those are the extent, okay? 
All right, thank you. Laurent would like to know, he says, I downloaded the program uh, January 1st. How do I upgrade it uh, for the bug fixes you mentioned? We, uh, as far as I know, NAP will allow us to keep putting it back. I think they just have a link to where a boss stores it. So for example, I think there's already a newer version out and uh, Jim, you know, had a, apparently those MP and, and E allowable calculations for chaos or have a minor problem in them. So there was things that we're working on right now. So my understanding is that boss will rebuild the install file. And if you simply go back to the NAP website, I think if you re-download it again, it will, uh, you have to uninstall your old version and then reinstall it again, and then that will provide the newest version. Take note of the version number that, that's shown at the top of the screen when it's open. Okay, So I was pointing out that it was showing you the name of the simulation file that you loaded, but to the left of that is the version number of the software. Just take note of that before you uninstall and then reinstall and check, you know, is it, a, is it an incremental increase in that number? If not, and no, that wasn't the, it wasn't the latest. So I, I'll have to seek guidance on that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there's instructions on that. All right, thank you, Mark. Uh, James would like to know, is the MP milk still overpredicted uh, in parentheses at high production levels, close print, if the model is using variable efficiency? It is, as, as near as, you know, based on the data that, Nutrient allowable or nutrient predicted milk is not overpredicted. It's right through the middle of the data, all the way up to about 120 pounds of milk a day. Okay, and that's the extent of our of our database and literature. So whether it's through the middle of the data at 130 and 140 and 150, I don't know, but I certainly hope so. Uh, my my comment was strictly related to that NE allowable and MP allowable. Those are historical ways of calculating it. They assume that nothing changes in the animal as you add more MP above maintenance. And that's clearly not the case, okay? They, the animal becomes less efficient as it goes up, either because it's catabolizing a larger, uh, you know, a, a larger fraction, or perhaps those maintenance functions are not fixed, you know, perhaps they do increment up. We have very little data on those maintenance functions you know, they're, they're characterized at lower levels of production and we're using them at higher levels. So we don't, we don't know for certain that those actually apply, but we can certainly see from looking at those predictions. And again, I, you know, those are in chapter 20, that, that it over predicts when you use that MP allowable and any allowables. My suggestion is look at it, you know, but I would, I would severely discount those when, you, when you're looking at high levels of production. All right, the next question comes in from Hector. Milk production does not seem to follow the law of diminishing returns to energy energy consumption, is it? Um, it does not, if it does not follow the law of diminishing returns, why not take into account the aspects pointed out by Blackster a long time ago? Um, well, I, I'm not sure what, you know, I would have to refresh my memory on what Blackster pointed out, but um, as far as we can, see that uh you know within an animal the uh, the animal is not able to for example spill energy okay and so it can store more energy in fat and so milk production uh, as you add more and more energy to the diet does tend to follow diminishing returns because there is a maximum level of production within a given animal and so as it consumes more energy it starts to shun larger proportions of that fat. And of course, there are controls on that too. And, and as it be, as it shunts more energy into fat, as they become uh, greater conditions, uh, greater amounts of fat, it shuts down the intake center. Okay, and So basically, the animal stops eating that extra energy, you provide higher energy density in the diet, and it's less. And I think those are, are at least partially captured in the model, but not entirely. Um, what I'll point out, though, is that um, the model's linear with respect to energy, uh, for the most part, other than some of those interactions between starch and fiber. 
And what, when we look at the data, it appears linear as well, but that's because we're looking at the data over time. Okay? And so we're looking at a mix of animals from 30 years, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and today. And as we selected animals for higher and higher levels of production, they have more capacity to make milk. And so that, that, that what might look like a diminishing curve keeps going up over time. So we tried to, to look at whether or not we could pull out any effects of time, which is something that the group out of Davis did in terms of the maintenance requirements. And it's just, there's just enough variance that we just cannot, we cannot reliably pull it out. We can get hints that there's uh, sort of that diminishing returns effect there, but nothing that we can actually have a lot of faith in, in terms of putting it in the model. All right, next question comes in from Mike. Uh, what is net protein? Please define. Net protein would be the amount of protein that, that uh, is deposited as protein, okay? So milk protein is net protein. Uh, gestational protein in the, you know, that's captured in the calf and the gestational tissues is, is net protein. Body tissue gain in, in protein is net protein. We don't convert to net protein at 100% efficiency. And so we have a conversion efficiency of somewhere where, you know, we're thinking the target, you know, somewhere around 65 to 70% to go from metabolizable protein to net protein. And we spill the excess as maintenance requirements, you know, as cat catabolic products, uh, endogenous urinary, et cetera. And so the net protein simply reflects, you know, our, our capture of metabolizable protein and net protein. And so one thing I, I probably should have made a point of is that, you know, in the past, our systems have all been metabolizable protein based. This is a net protein based system. Okay, we're, we're calculating off of net protein, just like we calculate off of net energy. And then we're doing our best to back calculate to what the metabolizable protein supply needs to be to be able to meet the targets for net protein output. All right. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I see we've passed the top of the hour. We still have several questions. Can you hang on for just a few more? Sure. Right. Next question comes in from Rolando. It says, despite choosing to express the amounts in kgs per day, the ration data is shown in grams. How can it be configured so it, that it is expressed in kgs? Yeah. You know, there's, there's always those choices on those reports. I mean, we, I was, um, I guess I was surprised how much time we spent on reports trying to configure everything. And so, um, you know, we, we tended to go with <clears throat> units and reports, you know, whether it's KG or grams that we felt made the best use of space because space and reports is also a problem. And so trying to get things crammed into the report so that you could get a summary of the area uh, in, in one table if possible, or, or as you can see, you know, in most areas, we ended up with two and three and even four tables. So um, there was there was certainly a, Rich Erdman, as you know, was sort of the uh, the gatekeeper on the reports. He, he didn't want to have all these massive number of reports. So consequently, no, we did not go to the effort of trying to allow the user to configure grams versus kilograms. You know, you can do pounds versus kilograms, but uh, when you choose when you choose the imperial, then you're going to get pounds and ounces. And when you choose metric, you're going to get kilograms and grams, but you're not able to select a report. Sorry. All right. Marina is asking if you could uh, please explain again the target value of predicted net protein production through a five day herd rolling average being smaller than 0.85. Okay. So I didn't, again, it's laid out in chapter 20. Um, but the, the, the problem we had as briefly as possible is that the there is diminishing returns on the protein side. And so there is definitely curvature. It's not it's not massive, but you can see that the quadratic term had a negative 205 in my example. Uh, in the old equations, they didn't use that quadratic term. Okay? And so it was just a linear. And so you would have overpredicted at that higher level of production by about two and five grams per day. And that problem would get worse the higher you get. So we have a quadratic, which means it plateaus. And the research data that are available in the literature plateau at a, at a value of about 1,300 grams of milk protein a day, 
which is equivalent to at, at 3O protein, if we're talking about Holsteins, something like 95 pounds of milk or 98. I forgot the exact thing. Well, that's not going to work on farm, okay? I mean, we, we got pens of cows all over the place that are producing more than that. And so what would happen then is if you didn't scale that quadratic somehow, it would simply say, hey, all cows on the farm that are, you know, pens that have 100 pounds of milk or more, they all have exactly the same requirement for MP. It doesn't matter if they're making 140 pounds of milk or 100 pounds of milk. It's the same. That's not the case, okay? So we're using that 305 uh, day rolling herd average for milk protein to represent the genetic potential of the animal and also the environmental state of the animal, including sort of health and you know, any, any uh, facilities, stress, et cetera, to help us scale that equation so that we can keep it, keep the predictions on the curved part of it, okay? Not at the top, not in, down in the linear part. And so under normal ration conditions, it's operating around that curved portion. So we need to look at that just to make sure that we're not getting above 0.85 in that ratio. And you probably shouldn't be below 0.5 either. Okay? That's unless it's a really pro, low protein diet. I mean, if you're trying to feed 100 pound cows a 14% protein diet or 13.5, which is potentially possible, you're going to be well up on that curve. And if you're trying to feed them a 20% protein diet, which you can also do, you're going to be way down on that curve. So just within the normal ranges, you're looking at probably 0.6 to 0.8 as a normal operating. Thanks, Mark. The next question comes in from Chris. Is there a way to display requirements in the ration tab versus having to go into the report? Um, there is. So basically on the inputs page on the program settings, you can choose whatever requirements. I mean, there's a whole long list there, including requirements and some of the balances, et cetera. So you can you can choose that on that drop down or from that drop down list to be showing up on the diet page so that you can then pay attention to those uh, those requirements as you're designing that ration. That's the intent of that. All right. Caitlin would like to know the absorbent coefficient for sulfur is missing from raw material database. It's a soft, is it a software issue or something else? No, there's no, uh, we do not consider absorbed sulfur requirements. We only consider, consider dietary requirements. And because there was not enough data on uh, sulfur absorption to be able to to derive those absorbed values. So there's four four minerals yet that are still expressed, including selenium, on a diet concentration basis because we do not have the absorbability data. Okay, uh, Khaled has a new uh, another question. Does the program uh, have alarms about mineral antagonism? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. No. Alejandro is asking, why is the display resolution so high? Um, in lower re resolution notebooks, the image is cut in half and we can't access all the functions. Ah, uh, didn't recognize that. Didn't know that. I don't know. I'll ask a boss. All right. Very well. Next question from Pedreg. Uh, where can we get access to the diet code for research? It is in the scripts folder. So when you install that software, it gets installed in the in the NASM directory on your C drive directly. Okay, it's not in my programs or anything like that. And within the NASM folder, there are several subfolders. One of them is labeled scripts. And within that folder, there are two scripts, and there's also a uh, I think there's a R Studio uh, file, and you can open R, the R. Assuming it's there, you can open the R Studio file, and it'll open both of those scripts in the file. Or you can just open the scripts directly and use them with R. One script is to read that XML file, which is what I was sort of showing on the top, and the other script is the entire model as used in, in the software. Mm -hmm. So if you run the first script, it will read that file. It will run the model and it will output all of the a whole, a whole bunch of vectors of data from the model. 
and it will output all of the tables that are in the reports as I was showing. All right. I've got another question asking if people could contact you directly. And, and if so, I'll, I'll forward that email. We don't need to have it now, but just uh, wanted to ask that question. Sure. I'm, I'm a public employee. So my, my, my emails on the website at Virginia Tech, and they're, they're happy to have me spend time answering them. It's for the public who pays our bills and pays our checks. Okay. All right. Very well. Uh, next question is, is there an IONA 4 question or adjustment in the growing heifer model? I think there is. Um, I'd have to go back and look. Um, as you might be surprised, but I can't actually remember everything that's in the model. But uh, there, I think there is in heifers as well as cows. Not in calves, though, as far as I know. Okay. Um, Alejandro is asking, um, how can we export the feeds and diets that we have created into the 20 uh, or the 2001 NRC software um, to this new library? Uh, sorry, that, that wasn't written. Not a that's, a hand, that's a hand entry job. Okay. Unless, I mean, you'd have to write a, essentially what you'd have to do is write a, a little program to take, you know, take the file because it, it, those are all stored in the file. It's just a flat file. You have to read in the file, which I, which we did that in the past, and then write it out as an XML uh, in the format that that they're saved in. So, you know, if you had a thousand of these to do, I would certainly do that. You know, maybe even a hundred, I might do that. 10, 15, 20, no, I would do it. Okay. Um, next question, is there a generic calf starter grain mix in the feed library or does a calf starter feed need to be constructed from base ingredients? Uh, there definitely are some growers. I think there's some calf starter grains. All right. And last question, another calf question. I'm getting a little long here. When entering calf age, is it the mean age uh, and weight for that diet or ending age weight for that diet? It is the mean age um we were we toyed with you know and, and actually i think i have it coded in the model but we didn't get it in the software to do a beginning and an ending weight you know so that you had a, a range but in the end it, it's a single simulation so if you really wanted to know how each of those animals operated throughout that age range you have to have multiple simulations so the mean is probably the, the correct value to use all right. Well, that's going to do it for today. I want to thank you, Mark, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at dowchem.com. The Real Science Lecture series of webinars continues with two more webinars in February. Next week on February 8th, we will welcome Dr. Tom Rathji from DNA Genetics. Dr. Rathji will be discussing the interaction between nutrition and genetics in the swine industry. And on February 15th, Dr. Charles Starkey from Auburn University discusses the many opportunities to upcycle low value proteins using functional food technologies that promote sustainability while enhancing profitability. Our next ruminant focus webinar will be on March 1st when Dr. Israel Flammenbaum with Cool Cows, he's from Israel by the way, will discuss the best ways to manage dairy cows in extremely hot environments. Visit balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform or visit balchem.com slash podcast. Subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size. And we'll send you a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Uh, Hannigan, thank you for joining us today.